Hi, my name is Lindsay Maestri. I'm the executive director here at Luca, which is where you're at today. And I'm here in our main gallery space and we're gonna take a tour of all four gallery spaces that we have here in our main building. This is a brand new show that just went up. Uh, it's called From Texas About Texas. It includes several artists from Texas uh, that, that make work largely about Texas, just as the title says. We're doing virtual tours today, obviously, because uh, we will be closed for First Friday Art Trail, which would be the opening of these exhibitions. So we wanted to really feature the artist um, and highlight them in a virtual way so that their work could still get out there and could be shown. Uh, in this exhibition, we have several pieces from each artist. Um, we have uh, Woodrow Blagg um, does these large black and whites. There's one on this end of the wall and then two towards the other. And um, they are graphite on paper. So they look like large black and white photographs of either tex Texas landscape or sort of uh, abandoned spaces, maybe in homestead spaces, but they're actually hand-drawn graphite. Uh, and he's from the Dallas area. And then another artist from the Dallas area, Linda Blackburn. Uh, she paints these scenes that really look like uh, old Hollywood kind of version of Texas, these westerns. Um, it almost feels like you're looking at a movie still sometimes when you're looking at her work. And then we also have Ken Little, who is a really well-known and celebrated uh, Texas sculptor. He is a, um, was the sculpture professor at UTSA for a number of years in San Antonio. Uh, this piece here, this deer piece made out of shoes um, and sort of a boot there up through the middle of that, uh, making those nods to Western wear. We have some more work by Linda Blackburn. Um, again, just looks like a you know, still directly out of a movie, out of kind of old Hollywood nods to the, to the Western or ideas of the West. And then uh, some more of the um, Woodrow Blag, Blag's work. Um, again, sort of that abandoned homestead space. We almost think we're um, in an old abandoned building or something um, in sort of this uh, isolated uh, space. Um, but graphite on paper. Again, looks just like a black and white photograph, but it's graphite on paper. Um, on this wall, on the other side, um, we have some work from uh, Chad Plunkett, who is the executive director of uh, the Charles Adams Studio Project, sort of our neighboring organization that's on three sides of us here at LUCA. Um, this whole show was supposed to be a part of the uh, Texas Painting Symposium, which the uh, which te uh, Texas Tech University was putting on, um, and the School of Art. But the symposium got canceled. Um, but we were still so glad to be able to put up the exhibitions. So this this one um, kind of plays with the idea of line. Chad's work plays with line and drawing, kind of in a in an interesting way for a three dimensional artist to be looking at two dimensional things um, and working with line. So that's how he got included in this, you know, primarily painting or drawing exhibition. Um, we also have B. C. Gilbert, who's a a former Lubbockite, but now is in Wichita Falls. Uh, these are prairie flowers. So these bright poppy sort of abstracted ideas of the prairie. We also have John Fleming, who paints sort of, uh, they always feel like, like rural life or small town Texas in a way. Um, again, kind of that nod to old ideas of Texas. And then some more of John Fleming's work, again, um, those nods to, to spaces in Texas, that kind of rural landscape or that, um, you know, that small town that you may come through that has that beautiful little downtown, um, but kind of looking at that vintage feel of it. Um, a, a beach, you know, in Texas we have not only the desert, but we also have beaches. <laughs> and then uh, probably my favorite piece um, and this show is kind of an, a nod to old Austin. Um, you know, you see Sam's Barbecue, um, this kind of restaurant that's been all sort of pieced together as you think of like an old barbecue place would be. 
And the line again plays really nicely with, um, with Chad's work, kind of that play in that line back and forth. Um, and again, NBC Gilbert's flowers here. And then also some more pieces um, by Chad Plunkett. Kind of, you get that adobe feel, you get uh, a structure of some sort forming out of those. And then I also really like that the um, material he's using feels like a fence material. It feels like something that would belong on a ranch. Um, but he's used it to construct these sort of loosely architectural uh, sculptures that, that hang on the wall. Um, so we can go look at another exhibition that's new for us if we want to. So in our uh, studio gallery here, we also have another new show for us. It's called Town and Country. Um, it's a juried exhibition, so it's actually a national juried exhibition, um, but the artists that applied were asked to either be from Texas or have a strong connection to Texas. So you grew up in Texas, you had some sort of connection in some way, or you went to school here. Um, so that's kind of the thing that holds that together a little bit. But again, this exhibition was put together as a part of that Texas Painting Symposium. Um, through, uh, through TTU. And so um, the juror, Chad Dawkins, was really looking at work that um, expands the idea of what painting can be or what painting is. So in this exhibition, you see things that are more traditional painting, and then you also see things that are very loosely painting. Um, and the, the entire symposium was meant to explore that topic of what painting is and what painting can be. So town and country, again, kind of thinking about those two concepts of Texas. We've got, um, you know, the major cities that we think about in Texas, um, and then also the country version of Texas. Um, if, you, if you live here or you're, you've been here or from here, um, you know that there are those kind of two separate spaces that exist in this state, um, and both are very prominent. Um, so you've got uh, a piece here that kind of makes a nod to that big sky of Texas. Um, and all of that blue. Um, you've got work from artists across Texas and then some that are out of state as well that, that do again have that tie to Texas. Catherine Allen here is the first place um, winner for the exhibition. So with a juried show, typically you get, um, you get prizes for the show. So artists apply to be a part of the show and then they, they might win a cash prize if the juror selects their work uh, to be the top work in the show. Um, which is the case for this. Just a, a real variety of, of work. Um, throughout the show, you'll see different formats. Uh, John Chen here is a Lubbock artist. Um, he actually, a lot of times, uses an airbrush to create his uh, paintings on these panels. Adam Farkas, a fiber piece here. Uh, they don't speak for us. So you kind of see this cowboy uh, fabric. There are a number of things you know, that this message may be saying to the viewer. Um, but you, know, you can kind of infer from maybe that it's that, that the idea, that classic idea of Texas or maybe of painting isn't what all of us are about. Um, we can also see some nods maybe to um, gender identities or um, other things that the artist is thinking about personally as they think about this idea of not one speaking for everyone. Uh, kind of a more classically abstract piece. And then we get into um, pieces that are digitally done. So digital painting is really growing, um, is a growing uh, genre of painting. And this is a digital painting by Emily Potts. Um, another fiber piece. by Casey Galloway. Um, again, a large crocheted piece that really uh, talks about painting by Jane Smith. It's, you know, it, it is a painting. It has painting on it, right? It's been painted, but it's a large crocheted piece. So you see a lot of different topics um, and subjects, which you usually do within a juried show, um, but they're all kind of loosely based around uh, the juror Chad Dawkins' idea of you know, what contemporary painting is or what contemporary painting can be. This is an exhibition by Brie Lam uh, and Rebecca Drolin. 
Um, it's called Something Familiar. And the interesting thing is that it's two separate bodies of work, but they have that overlap in the fact that what they're talking about is recontextualizing something familiar. So for Brie Lamb, um, she's recontextualizing uh, everyday objects, domestic objects. So she takes these objects and takes them out of the space we would typically see them in. So we might see something like a handheld mirror, but the background is completely void. It's just a color. So it really makes us think about that object in a different way and think about domestic objects and how we use them and consume them. And then Rebecca Dolan, uh, again, something familiar, the female body um, is what she talks about. But instead of this idea of taking hair away or taking teeth away, taking um, always taking things away from the female body to make it uh, smaller, um, and more vulnerable, she adds things to the female body. So she's always adding hair into her photographs or she's adding, um, in some instances, you'll see that she adds maybe balloons under the skin using a, uh, you know, a pantyhose to make the female body feel bigger um, and more abundant. She also has a, a video piece here. Um, entitled No. We just see this finger wagging and then the ponytail swaying back and forth. This piece, we've got that idea of taking hair away, but that hair is still on there. So you've got the, the shaving cream and the liquid, um, but the hair is still there and it's really highlighted with that um, lamp on it. Kind of these isolated body parts um, by masking what's around it. And that's really the same thing that Brie Lamb does too by taking these um, everyday objects and taking the background out of them. They're both sort of isolating things to highlight them. And this show is on display for an extra month um, because obviously with uh, you know COVID-19 restrictions, our artists did want to travel back. They're both from out of state. Um, one's currently in Arkansas and one's in New Mexico. New Mexico. Um, and so they, they couldn't quite travel back right now to come pick up the show. And it was a perfect time for us to be able just to leave it up for an extra month. So it will be here all the rest of the month and we're excited to still have it up. This is the Youth, uh, youth Art Month exhibition. Um, again, leaving this show up for another month, we had an artist um, who was not able uh, to bring the work in. That's something that galleries face uh, quite a bit with uh, right now, you know, we're, we're constantly shuffling things and looking at ways that we can still uh, have shows up and present them when artists aren't able to bring in the work that we had planned to bring in. Um, but we do love this show. It's Youth Art Month. So typically that's in March every year. It'll be up for March and April this year. Uh, the kiddos are out of school right now, so it's perfectly fine to leave it up a little longer. Um, but LISD, um, Lubbock ISD, uh, has um, this program that's run for years and Luca exhibits uh, the Blue Ribbon R winners every year. So every school in Lubbock ISD has at least one or two pieces here representing their school. Um, we work really closely with the art teachers in Lubbock who are fantastic. Um, and as you'll see, um, really talented young artists coming out of uh, you know, out of the show and out of this program. Um, if you have a young artist at home and you want to find things for them to do, uh, you can check out Luca's social media, uh, at Luca, um, at Luca Lubbock, uh, for Facebook and Instagram. And we have some virtual art projects online. So we would love for you to jump on there and check those out and keep those kiddos making, but enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Cassandra Troutman with Casapora Leather, and I'm in Casp Libwork Studio Number no. Three, and I make custom leather goods as well as costume design pieces for theater groups in the area and assume to be new neighbors. I first learned about Casp when I was a student at Texas Tech. Um, I got my MFA in Theater Design and Technology. I graduated about two years ago, um, and ever since I found out about Casp, I wanted to be here. <laughs> and so in November, the application was up for this space, and um, we got. It. So we'll be here for two years. Uh, my fiance Rob has the camera in his hand right now and he plays electric cello. We'll get to him in a little bit. I was really drawn to the space because of First Friday and the idea of having your own studio and living in the next room. And then you have the public that can come right to your door. You don't have to move your setup. Um, it's just here and you could do whatever you want with the space. Um, and you have a lot of cool opportunities with our, you know, with our neighbors and other areas of cast. 
um, like the Metal Foundry and uh, the Five and J Gallery. Um, so there's just a lot to do, I think, and I think there's a lot of things that we're going to be doing after this. Um, but there's a lot of events that we were planning on doing, um, especially our live leather classes uh, that we're postponing until at least May or sometime in the summer. Um, and then we've got a few events that were going to happen during First Fridays that I think we're just going to postpone to leave it next year because they were spring specific. So we, you know, a little disappointed there, but I think it'll give us more time to really plan. Um, we every month do something different. So it's kind of, you know, a revolving of ideas. Um, last month in May, or I'm sorry, March, um, we had a giant drawing wall with the public. So we will be doing those. Um, but uh, well, we're going to find another way for to engage the community. Um, because the ultimate goal of that is to take their drawings and to put them into a composition and laser engrave them onto a leather product to raise money uh, for the future studios that are being built here at CASP. Um, so we're still going to do those things, we're just thinking of different ways to do them to remain safe. Hi, my name is Robbie Stafford. Um, I'm one of the artists that lives in Studio 3 here at Charles Adams Studio Project. Um, my main focus is cello. Um, I do a street music kind of busking session every first Friday for the public. Um, a lot of, about three hours of playing. It's, it's a lot to prepare for and do, but the payoff is absolutely worth it because I get to show the community um, something different that they don't typically get to hear. My cello back behind me uh, that's Winston. He gets to sing for the people that walk by. Um, but lately here, um, we don't exactly have that opportunity to be able to share that with those that would normally get to be out in public due to the uh, recent health crises across Lubbock County right now. Um, but we are hopeful to continue our practice um, in the future which the next couple, or at least April, has been postponed for now, and May is kind of up in the air. It's because some way have to play by ear. With that being said, um, this is a time for me to be able to focus and perfect my craft, and hopefully by the time it comes back around, we'll get to show everybody what I've learned during this time of um, shelter in place and social distancing. But um, you can find my fiance Cassandra, who does all of her leather craft and costume designs, and all of our friends that we partner with to do theater productions, hopefully sometime this summer. Um, she is on Facebook and Instagram under Casapora, and you can find myself at Loop918 on Facebook, which is my newly found artist page. So you can give, all, give us some support by um, following us and keeping up to date with us as we go through um, our health management. So, thank you all. We'll see you next time. The first thing you have to learn is how to conscientiously pay attention, not take something, an experience, and put it in a box that has a label on it, but just don't bring any boxes.
there's a kind of protocol that we all have when we go out bush to be involved in the landscape and have an experience that is highly imaginative. But here's a funny thing. As soon as you bring language into experiential adventure, you truncate the experience. Language always collapses reality into meaning. And once it takes place, then much that's there at the periphery that might be useful three days later gets buried, it's lost. idiosyncrasies of attentiveness that define you can't really gallop. They can't get up and run if you keep stopping them to discover what you think the meaning of the thing is. So, so don't try to reduce what you're experiencing in language. language. This work represents 35 years of examples of different periods of, uh, of work that I did during my teaching career at Texas Tech University. I started teaching in um, 1983 and retired in 2018. This piece here is a very, very important piece in the development of my work. It's one of my first double wall pieces. Uh, it was influenced by my first experience traveling to the lower Pecos uh, Canyon lands. And I would collect clays and minerals. And for example, this photograph of eroded rock in the lower Pecos Canyon. And I wanted to come back to my studio and try to create this texture. So that's what's happening on the side there and also on the platter. And the, the lines and slip decoration comes from clays that I would collect while I would be in the canyon camping or hiking. These pieces are directly influenced by 4,000 year old pictographs that I saw in Rattlesnake Canyon, which are shown in this photograph. So all the work will have a story. This series of work, the cauldrons, the double wall cauldrons, were influenced by my experience growing up in a farming family where my mother and grandmother made soap and they made hominy and they would even wash clothes in big cast iron cauldrons and as a kid my job was to keep the fire burning hot around the pot. And when I started making pottery, I wanted to make big cauldrons like this. But um, when I tried making them just single wall, they would warp in the kiln. So one night I had a dream that if I made them double wall, I could put them on tripod feet and they wouldn't warp because of the engineering element of it, uh, the, the inner wall. 
kept it from warping and kept the shape. So that led me to a whole series of other work related to that. So sometimes I'll work with an idea and then incorporate some other idea that I eventually uh, invent or discover. These pieces were influenced by cotton gin cyclone dust collectors that you see in, in cotton gins. Uh, when I was a kid going to the cotton gin with my father, we would have to wait in line for hours to get the cotton processed. And I would draw these figures over and over because they look like people. And as a kid, I would put arms and legs and heads on them. So when I moved to Lubbock, that sparked that memory. And I started using that as a point of departure for making these noble jars. And they're glazed with uh, 22 karat gold. And the one over to the uh, left has platinum. And this piece I incorporated another influence. The piece over to the left was influenced when I was uh, a resident artist in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, they do something that's very, very interesting and scary. They make their scaffolding for high-rise buildings out of bamboo. And when you walk around the buildings, they were very thin, but people were walking and clamming on top of the bamboo. And I just thought that was really interesting. So when I came home, I started playing with building a wire uh, web around the pot and firing it. And the, the copper wire leaves a mark. So these pieces were influenced by when you fly over Lubbock and you see the irrigation circles and Playa Lakes. And uh, depending on the time of year, you get a different uh, texture, a different reflection, different surface. These were made using uh, uh, dust from dust storms mixed with other iron elements and sprayed on top of the piece when it was still very hot and it leaves this nice orange earthy texture and this is these lines are horsehair laid on top of the piece when it's when the piece is very hot and it singes it and leaves a permanent mark and then fuming and raku raku is a technique where you take the the piece out of the kiln when it's in the molten state and put it in a container and add elements on top of it. In this case, I added shredded paper and so you can still see slight shredded paper marks, which has a lot of texture, visual texture. And here, of course, I still enjoy making small pieces, although most of my pieces are large. I like that intimacy of making just a small piece that can be easily lived with. Uh, and these are different firing techniques. I wrote, co-authored a book called uh, Alternative Kilns and Firing Techniques where I show all of these wonderful techniques to get different textures and colors. And again, combining influences. I studied the martial arts. I have a black belt in Taekwondo. And there's a concept in the martial arts called relaxation and explosiveness. So the twisting of the forms, I wanted them to look as if they could move at any moment, as if they, I was capturing a sense of tension so that they look as if they're, they can move quickly, or snap back, kind of a dancer. I have, I, this one is even called dancers. And this piece is called Guardians. In 2005, I made my first trip to Cambodia. I received the Fulbright Hayes Fellowship, and I got to see Angkor Wat and all of the amazing things that took place in Cambodia, and I was fascinated with the 
huge sculptures in Angkor Wat and the trees that have now surrounded many of the buildings and they actually are holding up some of the buildings. The trees are called banyan trees. And so uh, even though I was already using the bird form and twisting them, I decided from looking at the banyan trees to make them longer and more sculptural, more lyrical. And, and using the faces from the sculptures and uh, taking them apart, deconstructing them. The pieces on the wall in this section of the gallery were influenced by my teaching career, teaching architecture students for 35 years and watching the development of architecture. When I retired, um, the laser cutter was a very big tool that architecture students used. They used a, the laser cutter to cut out their models. So myself and some other artists and uh, my colleagues, uh, Lahib Jado and John Chen, they were in, uh, in, uh, investigating using the laser cutter to draw images on paper and wood. So I decided to take porcelain tiles. These are very thin porcelain tiles. They're three, one, two, three. I put them together and I do drawings of my pots that were influenced by looking at pottery through the spot hole of the kiln. And there's a wonderful photograph of the spot hole. So you can look in and you can tell the temperature of the clay and the temperature of the, uh, the firing by the cones, which are these things here. And they drop, each one drops over at a certain temperature. So when the last one falls over, it's 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a dramatic thing looking into that kiln. So I would do a drawing of pots, then send it to the laser cutter, put the tiles down and the laser cutter cuts the image. And then sometimes I would take a, make a stencil that I would then lay on top of the piece and then glaze around it. And they, they are fired multiple times, sometimes 10 times to get the depth and textures that you see in, in these surfaces. It's very time consuming. So I've decided that I'm gonna work more with wet clay instead of the laser cut pieces. I like getting my hands wet. But before I stopped doing that, I made a series of, of prints, six screen prints, and also using the laser cutter. The one thing that connects all the work, I started keeping a journal and I started collecting dreams. And one night I had a dream. I dreamt that I was in Santa Fe and I saw my work. It had the same texture, same forms. There are stories connected to each piece. I still come here 
every day and work on stuff. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't really involve anyone else. So I'm really grateful for that, and I'm really grateful for this space. Um, and I'm gonna be showing you guys a little bit of what I've been working on and uh, what I would be displaying if we still had a first Friday art trail. So um, I've been working on a painting, I guess, but always working on plant stuff. So I will give you guys a tour of that and um, hope everyone is doing well out there. Thanks. So as you can see, I have quite a mess here. Uh, just a kind of a part of the process um, Propagating and I collect these agaves so. um, But anyways, here's uh, Some of the stuff I've been working on plant wise these terrariums. They're all for sale um, Y'all can just if anyone's interested Instagram message me um, They're really nice um, this one is really cool. Yeah, just, um, kind of stocking up on terrariums right now. But, uh, yeah, like I said, they're all for sale. Um, everything I, I have is pretty much for sale. I really like this snake plant and that, um, Another one, an air plant and a cactus. This thing, people tend to overlook. Um, I really love this. Uh, it's uh, bromeliad and an aloe and some succulents and a fern that is just absolutely loving it. Um, but all these things are attaching to this wood. They're all epiphytes. So, um, it's a really cool piece. Um, these, these bromeliads are kind of bouncing back. They've had a rough time, but now they're starting to grow and thrive. Um, been having fun with the lampshade thing. Um, this sculpture I am about to redo for a client. It's gonna be very lush, taking a bunch of that stuff out of there. This guy I took back from JMB. It was sitting on the refrigerator at JMB for a long time. And I clean I was cleaning it up for him and I added some moss. Um, it is very happy ponytail palm. But um, I don't know if I'm gonna take it back to him, honestly. But I probably will. I'm just really in love with it. Uh, had a lot of history with it. That's a from an old drum kit of mine I grew up playing on. Some agaves that friend Courtney gave me. Um, this is a piece, one of those agaves I just stuck in there, but I'm gonna do something like that, plant something in there, and it'll be kind of a outdoor installation. Um, but it might be indoor too, I don't know. I think I'm gonna plant a barrel cactus in it. This thing has a long ways to go. It's come a long ways, but it has a long ways to go. I need to really clean it up and I'm still gonna be adding a lot of things to it. I don't like uh, how I did the lights on those towers. They're a little too much, but, um, and the clouds also need a lot of work. So um, these are just some of my finished paintings. Uh, I've posted pretty much everything that you're seeing. Um, abstract piece my Sasha that has always been around I need to get frames for these things um, really love that piece too one of my favorites a lot of people's favorite actually but uh, yeah everything's for sale again um, that fern is not for sale that is my staghorn fern that I absolutely love and have had for years. Um, this table piece, this glass was a gift um, 
from somebody dear to me and I have just been wanting to put stuff in it so I put these orchids in it along with a driftwood piece that I got from my hike the other day. This guy is one, it's got grow lights in it. Uh, just a really fun piece I'm very proud of. Um, that one is for sale as well. But um, yeah, I don't know, that's kind of it. Um, oh, I'm redoing a wall piece right here. I'm just kind of letting it grow in, but that's gonna go hang up on the wall. I'm actually gonna concrete it into there. It's an old piece that I'm redoing and I'm adding, gonna add concrete to uh, secure all those plants in there. But anyways, guys, that's pretty much what I've been up to. Um, Oh yeah, there's these pieces also. Some smaller, this whole Orthia is blooming. Gorgeous. And this piece a lot of people really like, and I really like it too. Very happy growing in. I've been loving incorporating the um, crystals into everything. Um, just really, it's a cool effect. Add that one in there too. Bad reflection, but anyways, guys, um, I think we're gonna put information on how to contact me, and um, if you're interested in anything, so um, let me know. Thanks, guys. I hope you're all doing very well throughout all this mess, and. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Danielle Eats, and if you don't already know, I'm one of the artists in residence at the Charles Adams Studio Project, and so I'll be showing you some work that I've been working on um, since First Friday has been canceled. Um, so I'm a poet, installation artist, and a bookbinder, and so recently I've been working on a little bit more poetry, and I've been doing a lot of writing. So um, one project that I've been working on is a chapbook of poetry called Tar Baby. 
and so tar baby um has about 20 poems in it and most of the poems are about generational pain black woman black identity and afrofuturism and a lot of the work is inspired by tony morris and malcolm x and the musician tiara whack and so right now i am selling the themes by mail on a sliding scale fee so you can pay as you want pay as little or as much as you have and so the minimum for each one of them is three dollars so you can pay as little as you want or as much as you want and 20 percent of the proceeds go to east lubbock art house and so i'll be i'll be selling them um through the month of april so i just wanted to read one of the poems from tar baby So this is Stop Calling Me African American, Have Your Negress. And she vomited forth her firstborn, wrapped her in hand-me-down clothes, and asked, Where is she that was born ghetto, black, and ugly as ever? Is she more gifted than our queen, or is she a mistake? Because she wasn't supposed to be this black and opinionated enough to try and fight the power, like the power wasn't the one giving out food stamps. She's your negress. She bends her knees, cracks her back, hands placed in just the right place, stares at you as she looks across her shoulder and smiles, as she moves her body to the music that's playing in her head. The life she's living is a house on fire covered in blood, overweight and short of breath. She dances too much and needs her inhaler. She's pop, pop, shake, shake, boom, booms waiting to be on BET's uncut so they can have a casting call for her. That's it. And if you'd like to purchase Tar Baby, um, you can send me um, funds through Venmo at Danielle Demetria, or you can send me um, a payment through PayPal at Danny Loves Her Some Pickles at gmail.com. Thanks again. This is Co-Ops Research and Projects, and uh, we're an ad hoc DIY gallery. We've been open for almost one year. We do um, shows where we bring in artists, where we curate exhibitions. There are multiple members to the co-op, uh, myself, as well as Cody Arnall and Lindsay Maestri. There's uh, Aaron Hegert and his wife, Natalie Hegert. There's also Andrew Weathers and his wife, uh, Gretchen Korsmo. And then lastly, and certainly not least, two more, a power duo couple. There's Seth Warren Crow and Heather Warren Crow. So together we form the members of Co-op Research and Projects. And this is the space here. We're both a gallery space and a studio space for artists, uh, myself, Cody, and Aaron. And we have studio space in the back. So this is the current exhibition up now by Carolyn Doherty. Uh, it's called Ruse de Guerre. Uh, which basically translates to false flag, the term used in war whenever one side of um, a battling duo will fly the flag of their enemy, uh, it, basically to show that they're their friend when in fact they're foe. So that's what this exhibition is dealing with here. Caroline's based out of Buffalo, New York at the moment, originally from Massachusetts. What, what I like about this show is that it focuses primarily on the flags. And there's actually two different ways that we can show this particular work. One is, as you see it here, where they're installed on the inside of the gallery. But we also have installed flag mounts on the exterior of the gallery, so they can be mounted on the exterior to capitalize on the windiness of Lubbock, Texas. But contrasting to the flags, which really occupy a, a sort of have a visual presence in the gallery are these small little pieces. There's one here on this wall and one on the adjacent wall. And um, there's sort of these quiet moments that are very easily missed. This is what you're looking at now, a cast bronze almond. So Caroline made a mold of an almond and cast around 72 of these in, in bronze. Uh, this is just one here. And she also has this uh, little paper mache micro megaphone thing here on this wall. Yeah, very delicate, quiet work. 
Caroline's from Buffalo, New York, and she came to Lubbock to specifically do this installation. And while she was here for over a uh, two week period as a sort of unofficial artist in residence program here at Co-Opt, she made this video work. So we took her true false flags that are installed in the gallery. We mounted them in the back of pickup trucks and she choreographed this, this dance out on a farm in shallow water, Texas, um, where these trucks are just going in circles, continually looping into one another. And that's the video piece that you see in, in this particular room. The main reason that co-op exists is uh, it exists as an art studio for Cody and myself and Aaron. Uh, we got together originally just over drinks, looking for artist studio space, and this is the space that we ended up in. So first and foremost, Co-Opt has been functioning for us as a working artist studio. And that's the space we're in now. Most of the works you're seeing are Cody Arnall's pieces. He just got back from a residency up in New York. So he just brought back those pieces and it, in many ways, Co-Opt exists uh, in response to the First Friday uh, art trail. You know, anybody who's gone to that event can, can see that it's exploded. There's, in fact, almost too many people at these events. One of the reasons we can't open up uh, in our current situation with the, with the virus. So we figured about a year ago that Lubbock really had room to grow, to expand out beyond the first Friday venue. And so we have specifically catered ourselves to small audience exhibitions. Um, we get maybe a dozen, two dozen people show up to our shows and we typically do them like mid month. So we're, we're not interested in doing a first Friday event. In fact, we're, we're willing to do shows on Sundays or Thursdays. We're willing to do them in on the 13th or 14th of the month rather than that first Friday event, which everyone is expecting. Um, in short, we feel that there's room to grow and expand in Lubbock in the arts. And we're seeing opportunities, not just with us, but with other people attempting to do that in Lubbock as well, which is really exciting as an artist because it shows that, that Lubbock is growing in its cultivation of creativity in the arts. So yeah, that's why we're doing what we're doing. The other thing that we have here at Co-Opt Research and Projects is a curated concert series by Andrew Weathers and Gretchen Korsmo. It's called Longitudes. Uh, until now, we've had roughly 12 of these experimental and improvised performances by artists from all over the country, but as well as local artists like Above the Empire. We've also had uh, Tyler Simpson come and play some jazz music, really good stuff. Essentially, it's performances that wouldn't happen in other venues here in town. So it's much more experimental. Occasionally there's video components to it. We've had artists come in and do seed bombings in the alleyway as part of a sound experience. Um, so it's very eclectic, very different. It's not something that you can go see at like Jake's back room or anything like that. Um, so that's sort of another element to co-opt where we're not just providing the visual arts, but also the sound arts as well. It's, we're really catering to forms of experimental creativity. Hello everyone, and thank you all for tuning in. My name is Leslie Wolf, and I'm assistant professor in art history at Texas Tech University. I'm also curator of the exhibition Layered Voices, Process, and Paper in Contemporary Native American Art, which is on view now at the Landmark Gallery in the School of Art at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. I wanna take the next few minutes and walk you through the gallery and just speak a bit about the works in this exhibition. Uh, so the exhibition features works on paper by seven contemporary artists, each of whom identify as Native American. Layered Voices was organized in conjunction with the 52nd Annual Comparative Literature Symposium here at Texas Tech that took place in March. Um, and this powerful convening of interdisciplinary scholars, activists, and writers, which I was so honored to take part in, centered on the idea of indigeneity, a conceptual lens that situates the worldviews of indigenous communities as an alternative to Eurocentric ways of being and thinking in the world. 
As a complement to the symposium's emphasis on literary indigenous languages, we sought to explore the myriad visual languages crafted by Native American artists today. So the exhibition's title, Layered Voices, is a nod to the dynamic interplay that all of these artworks share, both in medium and message. One artist whose work masterfully navigates these complex layerings of influences, voices, and visions is Jean Quictissi Smith, an artist of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation. We're fortunate to have three works by Quictissi Smith on view here, including this work titled War is Heck, in which Quictissi Smith has utilized layered processes, which give her work its signature assemblage aesthetic. By piecing together wide-ranging images from Moybridge's 19th century photographic stills to Mexican Loteria cards to a U.S. newspaper headline about war, Quick to See Smith creates a new visual reality in which multiple cultures cohabit the same compositional space. Quick to see Smith often grounds her monumental compositions in some sort of larger icon or image, like the horse or, in the case of this work, celebrate 40,000 years, the rabbit. Here, Quick to See Smith harnesses the universal image of the rabbit, one that has been seen in petroglyphs going back many thousands of years, to reconsider what we include or exclude when we use the term American. The work boldly states, celebrate 40,000 years of American art, which is really a challenge to the viewer, a directive to acknowledge the deeper truths that arts in the Americas have indeed been active for 40,000 years. Next, we have four works by Neil Ambrose Smith, son of Jean Quictissi Smith, and a painter, printmaker, and educator in his own right. Much of Ambrose Smith's work references the intersections of technology, Native American life, and Western frameworks that have been violently imposed onto and entangled with Native lifeways. This futurist aesthetic also parallels Ambrose Smith's innovative artistic techniques in which he persistently explores eco-friendly processes and easily accessible materials for his printmaking and painting practices. In preparation for this exhibition, he generously provided these poetic, insightful notes for each of his works, which I found to be not so much didactics, but really extensions of his artwork. Uh, so I wanted to share some of them here. For the work seen here, titled Modern Love, produced in 2019, he wrote, quote, contemporary love is 3D goggles and you can skip the dating crap, end quote which I think resonates deeply in this moment where we're forced to create intimacy virtually and to really confront his futurist images with a new sense of empathy and urgency. Through these futurist images, Ambrose Smith also stresses environmental concerns. He ponders the overfishing of our oceans, for instance, and the depletion of that ecosystem in the work we previously saw, which is entitled Do Fish Dream? Question mark. In his notes, the artist responds to his own question of do fish dream with the hopes that they do because soon all we will have left is, quote, fish dreams. Next, we have four prints by Navajo artist Michael McCabe. McCabe runs the Fourth Dimension Print Studio in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he collaborates with artists and also produces his own prints. He primarily works in monotype processes using viscosity and chincole techniques, which are both on view in this exhibition. McCabe's viscosity prints, which we see here with their ethereal, almost microbial backgrounds, are punctuated by scratches and smudges, which you can see that McCabe has carefully etched into the plate with his knuckles and fingernails. I appreciate how we see an index then of the artist's physical encounter with the work here. These marks also reference McCabe's struggles with psoriatic arthritis, which has limited his mobility and thus forced him to consider new ways to craft his compositions if, over the last decade. Recently, McCabe's work has become increasingly autobiographical, even as he maintains a very abstract aesthetic, as you can see. In the Chincole monoprint that we just recently saw, McCabe's face appears at center, which he has incorporated here through a Xerox transfer and then layered with many other images that come from vintage papers and letters that he's collected over the years. So the work is both autobiographical and archival in this beautifully poetic way. 
Next, the youngest artist in the group is Michaela Patton, who works in a variety of mixed media, including jewelry making, and who is a recent graduate of the renowned IAIA, Institute of American Indian Arts, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she in fact studied under artist Neil Ambrose Smith. Looking at her prints, I think it's shocking to realize that Patton is just emerging as an artist because her work conveys such a mature and unique vision of her Oglala Lakota heritage in which she carefully considers balance and composition and color and puts that aesthetic into conversation with her cultural references. Her work specifically highlights symbols and images of female empowerment, such as the monoprint Her from 2019, um, which we see here, where Patton centers our gaze on these beautifully stacked triangles that symbolize female energy in her nation. We see them here rendered as a kind of backbone in which delicacy and strength coexist. She also draws upon the image of elk teeth, a direct reference to feminine power, which we see in this work here entitled Worth the Memories, which is also from 2019. This rhythmic composition shows an abstracted and stylized rendering of the sewing of elk teeth onto a female garment, which you can see by the beads and string in the image. Next, we have four works by the celebrated Navajo artist Melanie Yazzie, who is currently on the faculty at the University of Colorado Boulder. This array of works, which showcase Yazzie's artistic range, comprise collage and mixed media, such as print, paint, and yarn. In this way, Yazzie's works are literally layered. In this work, Going Over and Over It All, from 2017, we see a visual narrative that seems to unfold cinematically, in which we are confronted with a series of maps onto which Yazi has affixed a variety of organic and geometric forms. These maps visualize claims to land on settler terms. Yazi's marks literally disrupt that colonial vision with a new plurality of images. According to Yazi, her artistic intent follows the Navajo dictum, walk in beauty, which is to say, walk through centeredness and harmony. The topics underscoring her work are difficult ones about the environment, about life cycles, health and wellness, and social justice, especially for Native American communities, but she approaches these issues almost subversively from positions of positivity, unity, and peace. This attitude is also visible in the distinctly joyous colors and forms of her work that really define her signature aesthetic. Yazi also seems an artist of particular relevance to include in this, uh, in this exhibition for her work engaged with indigenous communities around the world. She travels and teaches extensively to forge indigenous networks and solidarity across the globe. And like so many of the artists in this exhibition, she is a dedicated educator, an advocate, and an activist as much as she is an artist. Now, as we turn the corner here, we come to a unique work in this exhibition, which is a mixed media installation by the artist Deborah Hojola, who's based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and who belongs to the pueblos of Isleta and Jemez. We were fortunate to have her here in January to install this site-specific work, which comprises a series of five hanging scrolls on which we see a variety of printed images, including lithographs and stamps that include both abstract designs and figural forms. These scrolls encase a central hanging figure hovering above a red and white design rendered in clay earth, whose complementarity signifies Hohola's Pueblo affiliations. Hohola formed the female silhouette above from willow branches collected on her walks across her pueblo. Hohola refers to this female form as her willow woman, who references our strained relationship to Mother Earth, in which we take so much and often neglect to give back. Much of Hohola's work tackles this idea of female environmental stewardship, including in the earthen materials that she utilizes. 
This work also references the tenuous relationship we have to Earth through the gentle sways of the willow woman and the scrolls as bodies move through the gallery. So there's a kinetic connection between viewer and artwork here. As an arts consultant and curator, Hohola's research practice informs her artistic work, and many of the forms seen in this installation come from this rigorous study and stewardship of her Puebla heritage. Last, but certainly not least, we've included seven works on paper by Caro and Win Winnebago artist Dolores Purdy. Her style of brightly colored, highly geometric compositions that often depict whimsical or tongue-in-cheek visions of native life serve as striking contrasts to the 19th century ledger pages on which Purdy draws her compositions. These ledger pages, on which we can see the remnants of texts from the 19th century, not only serve to historicize the ways in which we perceive Native Americans in the U.S. imagination, but also directly reference the imprisonment of Purdy's direct Caddo ancestors, who were incarcerated without trial by the U.S. government at Fort Marion, Florida, between the years of 1875 and 1878. These warriors, rebuked for their involvement in the Red River Wars, found respite during their incarceration through these art forms. They became known for the hundreds of drawings they produced on ledger pages, which were previously used to document inventory by the military and traders. These artists used this inventory paper for the subversive act of recording or taking stock of their native victories and feats in a genre that became known as warrior art. Today, Purdy's work inserts a female perspective into this male artistic genre. Rather than conveying images of male bravery, Purdy honors her ancestors through her warrior art with a kind of vivid, playful aesthetic that Purdy relates to influences from Art Deco and psychedelic pop art movements. Purdy's work thus conveys a poignant layering of traumatic histories with innovative visual strategies. I want to thank you all for taking the time to walk through the gallery with me. Before we end, I want to acknowledge the artists who generously contributed their work to this exhibition. Also, the amazing student gallery and graphic design assistants who made this possible. And to Landmark Arts Director Joe Arredondo and Assistant Director Scotty Hensler, I want to extend my sincere thanks. Thank you.